Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us join our voices in singing and gathering him, hymn number 393.
you all. And also with you. Let us now pray together the prayer of the day, which can be found in the worship book of Israel. Glorious and gracious God, you have chosen us as your own, and by the power and name of Christ, you protect us from evil. By your Spirit, transform us and your beloved world, that we may find our joy in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Joseph called Barsabbas, 
who was also known as Justus, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please turn to page 338 in your hymnals. And we will pray responsibly Psalm number 1. <laughs> Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and, and they meditate on God's teaching day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are the shepherds who live most away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor sit in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall be destroyed. Our second reading this morning is from the book of 1 John, 5th chapter, verses 9 through 13, which can be found in your two Bibles on page 991. In this reading, God has borne witness to the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Whoever believes in the Son of God believes in the witness of God and has the promise of eternal life. And now the reading from the first letter of John. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that He has testified to His Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning the Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in the Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. Savior Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Amen. We have come to the end of the Easter season, haven't we? Throughout this season, we have heard the stories once again recounting the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And we read and heard about how the apostles, the disciples, and all the followers of Jesus adjusted to the idea of Scripture being fulfilled. As Easter people, we are encouraged to hope in the assurance of Jesus' continuing presence now that the work for which he was sent has been accomplished. Today's Gospel text takes us to the next level. This is the point in our journey where we ask ourselves how God is calling us and what is God calling us to be and to do. We know that next Sunday is Pentecost, right? Yes. Right, okay. The giving of the Holy Spirit. But do we know what this past Thursday was? It's a high festival in our church. <coughs> the festival of the ascension of our Lord. The festival of the ascension gives us the chance to think about it and to acknowledge it and recognize it. It is worthwhile and valuable for us as Christians if for no other reason than that it forces us to consider why on earth Jesus ascended and what does it have to do with us at all. Because it's right there in the Bible. Luke reports it twice. Once at the end of his gospel, and again in the beginning of his book, The Acts of the Apostles. So Luke must think there's some reason for the ascension, and he must think there's some reason for us to know about it. The story of the ascension. To many non-believers, it makes no sense at all, does it? Really? Why in the world would this story, with this tale of Jesus in his resurrected body, being lifted up from the earth into heaven, end up forming such a central part of the gospel and the creeds of our church? How does it go in the Apostles' Creed? He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Or as Luke writes in his book of Acts, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their sight. This record of the bodily ascension of Jesus into heaven after his death and resurrection is a strange story to those who do not believe, one that is hard to understand. But for us, for all who believe, it is a story of tremendous comfort. For it points to, and it completes, the story of who Jesus was and is, namely the Son of the living God. He is the one who came down from heaven and took upon himself human flesh, and who, having died for us, takes the essential part of our nature back with him into heaven, where he, and by implication us, are made holy. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father, and he shares completely in the nature of the Father. He is there to intercede for us and to care for us until he returns again, in the same manner in which he left us upon the clouds. The ascension is that part of the story of Jesus Christ that allows us to say that where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there. The ascension is that part of the gospel that allows us to say that unto Jesus every knee shall bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. The ascension preserves what we call the mystery of the Holy Trinity, that God is both three and one. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Our Jesus, our Savior, did not simply fade away like some breath on the wind after his resurrection. His form, his substance, his identity are made one with the Father's, and yet remain unique. Martin Luther writes that Christ ascended to preserve us forever in God's grace through his intercessions and to give us power and victory over the terrors of sin, Satan, and the temptations of this world and our flesh. These are our true enemies. Yet Christ is far above them, and we in him are too. Our Lutheran Church celebrates the ascension to emphasize that Christ's ascension to the right hand of the Father gave him the power and the authority to deliver exactly what he has promised, his body and blood, 
given for you and for me for the forgiveness of our sins. This ascension into heaven marks not the distance of Christ from people, but rather his nearness to us. While Christ may not be visible to us in his body, as he was to his disciples during his ministry on earth, he is visible to us in the sacraments, where he himself is behind the bread and the wine, giving to us, as his words promise, his very body and blood. In the Lord's Supper, Christ gives to us the very same body that ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of the Father and who has all the authority in heaven and on earth. He gives us his body and blood to strengthen our faith and to preserve us until he returns in glory when we will all see him face to face. As we recall Ascension Day, recall what Jesus accomplished for us when he ascended into heaven. And I say this again. He received all authority in heaven and on earth so that he can draw near to us and deliver to us what he has promised. Recall how his ascension means that Jesus is not far from us, but so close that he puts his very body and blood into our mouths for the forgiveness of all our sins. In the Lord's Supper, our ascended Lord draws closer to us than ever. His ascension means that he can do exactly what he promises. The ascension of Christ into heaven marks one of the most important holy days in the entire church calendar. And it is a marvelous story, the story of the ascension. When you believe, it assures us of our own future with him. If the story of the ascension is hard for un unbelievers to read and understand, then our gospel text for today is probably even more so. For here we have recorded a portion of the prayer of Jesus on the night of his betrayal, the portion that we call Jesus' high priestly prayer. This talk of being in the world, but not of the world, is confusing to those outside of the church, isn't it? So also is the talk about how Jesus and the Father share all things, both in this world and in the next, including us. If you read this passage a couple of times, and I really suggest that you do, two things pop out. One is that Jesus is worried about the group of followers he is leaving behind. And two is that Jesus is grateful to God that he has these followers, including you and I. Lutheran theologian Richard H. Lenski writes, we are allowed to see just how Jesus regards his disciples now that he is on the point of leaving them. He is voicing his inmost thoughts regarding them. These are the utterances of profound love with every word telling how Jesus and his great mission are wrapped up in the disciples, how his great work has succeeded in them and brought them to the present hour, when in leaving them, Jesus can place them into the Father's care. This intense love wells up from Jesus' heart in word after word, delighting to reveal how inexpressibly dear these men are to Jesus. Jesus prays for his disciples and for us, knowing what difficulties we will have to face. He reminds them and us that we have been called and consecrated, or to use the word in today's text, sanctified. In the Hebrew tradition, to be consecrated meant to be set apart for a specific purpose. Things were set apart for use in the temple, and more importantly, people were set apart to do God's work. To be set apart means that we do not go into hiding, but we realize that we have been called and are to be agents of God in the world. We are sanctified or consecrated in truth. The people of God us, we are consecrated, a chosen people, but we are not to boast and feel privileged, for we have a responsibility. We, as Jesus' community, must live out the responsibility of our call, that consecration and truth. We are called to work for justice, peace, love, and ethical behavior in the world. The forces against us belong to the world that Jesus mentions in his prayer. And knowing the power of the world, he is praying for us as we go out to bring his message. 
It is evident from Jesus' words that he has planted something in us that gives us a different vision, a different way of being and acting. He has planted in us a word that he has received from the Father. It causes us to see things in another light, to evaluate ourselves and others by an understanding, the standard of love. Therefore, the talk of being in the world, but not of the world, it serves to identify us more fully with him, who himself was in the world, but not of the world. Jesus doesn't want his disciples, and as Pastor Benny says, we are all his disciples. He doesn't want his disciples to pull out of this world and start a new nation on some distant island. Because if that was the plan, he would have said so. Rather, he sends us equipped to go into the world to make a difference, and to do so as ones who are not of this world, but rather are consecrated in truth. So what does it mean to be in the world, but not of the world? To live in the world and still be a not of the world can sometimes be a big mystery for Christians, can it? We have our place in the world, in society, in the workplace, in our family, in organizations, and among our friends, both Christian and non-Christian. Christians are needed here. We are the salt of the earth. And as Jesus says, we are the light of the world. But we Christians are not of this world. To be of the world means to be driven by particular ways of thinking, values, or patterns of behavior in a world that has fallen away from God, that no longer depends on Him. And in countless ways, is influenced and shaped, as Paul says, by the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. We're influenced by the world's way of thinking every day, aren't we? Lots of things are contrary to God's will, but obvious and acceptable for the world. First and foremost, think of yourself. Live for this life only by attempting to get as much as you possibly can out of it. Covet, desire to be the center of attention, be in control, live the good life, and so on. The whole world's values are affected by these views. And yet, we as Christians are supposed to live in, work in, and make contributions to this world while thinking in a completely different way with a completely different set of values. It isn't easy at all, is it? This is why Jesus prays that his disciples will be protected from evil. We need to pray this prayer every day. In fact, we do it every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. We pray that God leads us not into temptation, but delivers us from evil. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul has given us this advice, to test everything and hold fast to what is good. Isn't that what it means to be in the world, but not of it? And isn't that what it means to be consecrated in truth? And as Jesus prays in the opening of his prayer, protected by God's holy name, it doesn't make sense unless you believe, and then it does. And so does the ascension. It makes clear just who we are and what we have in Jesus Christ. We have the story not only of God taking on flesh, and dwelling among us, fully human, fully one of us. But we also have that human one taking our nature with him back to God, being there, ruling there, and being everywhere. Father Robert Barron, founder of Word on Fire, says these words, the ascent of Jesus' body into heaven and the descent of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost is the meeting of heaven and earth. When we, the church, reach out to the poor, the hungry, the homeless, this is the meaning of heaven and earth. And as Father Barron says, this is our commission now, to reconcile heaven and earth. The ascension is the completion of the story, save one item, the giving of the Holy Spirit, which we celebrate next week. As Jesus says in his high priestly prayer, I will remain in the world no longer, but I am coming to you. Because Jesus is glorified and lifted up to God. Because Jesus is ascended into heaven, he is able to be with us now. Because he has been sanctified, he can sanctify us. His prayer for us is heard. We do not need to look up and wonder where he is. For by his going, he is able to come to us. What we are to do 
is open ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the word that God has given us and go out into the world and do what we are to do, knowing that God will protect us and bring us safe to his side when our work and witness is done. Christ has promised to be with us till the end of time. And he who is our high priest and intercessor is also the Son of Man, still bearing the scars of his suffering and death, the marks of his love. We have therefore an advocate who knows human existence at its most extreme limits, and yet has been raised to the Father's side. Whereas the ascended and glorified Lord, we worship him this day and forevermore. Amen. <clears throat>